I, I'm talking with the one and only Kiprios. How are you? Uh, man, I am excellent. Tuesday, I just finished coaching my daughter's basketball team, and then I refed the boys' team afterwards. So, you know, crazy, crazy life over here in North Vancouver. But, um, yeah, man, life is wonderful. Yeah, yeah. No, no complaints out here. And, uh, you know, we're jam- just end of the month trying to, trying to handle it, trying to make it over and through another month. Yeah, no, that's fair. So uh, for, for anyone who is, who is unaware, um, I, I try to give credit where credit is due. Uh, ever since the release of 1212 back in 2009, I, I immediately glommed on to one song and that song being one and only. And uh, you graciously give me, gave me permission to use that song. And it's forever been the theme to my show, which used to be the flip side, which is now just the Media Jack podcast. Yep. And I, I get compliments on it all the time, but I can't play guitar that well, nor can I uh, sing or rap or anything of the sort. I, I'll keep directing it, all the attention towards you. Uh, you have since released uh, The Lapdog, The Midnight Sun, uh, also yep. an, an actor, still a songwriter, and um, yep. you still do live streams. Uh, during the pandemic, you were a saving grace when it came to just providing entertainment you are still a a busy busy artist and i appreciate that so what gaps have i missed here you you know it's funny you you missed some gaps but you haven't missed a ton so some of the gaps that you missed is are are things that, that that came around full cycle so I did a play called Ash Rising years ago. And uh, so I did the lyrics and the music for it. And the music I was helped by, by a guy named Stylist from here, who's gone on to do some incredible stuff as, as a DJ, as a programmer, as a producer, just a wickedly talented dude. And we banged that out. And they it was for a theater company in Vancouver called Green Thumb. And we thought it was going to be a three-month run, and that was it. Essentially, it goes to high schools, and it was going to high schools that were where kids were a little bit more prone to drugs. And crystal meth at the time was, was a big was a big problem. This is about 12 years ago. Yeah. And um, anyhow, we had written a play basically trying to tie hip hop and a kid that was into rap into the dangers of crystal meth. Hmm. It went, it ended up touring for about a year and a half and was very successful. Wow. Um, and just again, high school, but it went, it went across Canada, it was in New York, it went to Australia, you know, it just it just did really well. It was just a little, uh, and then we did another play in Calgary, probably, yeah, maybe, maybe 10 years ago. So a couple years ago, they decided to, they wanted to update the first one. So the first one was called Cranked, pardon me, the second one was called Ash Rise, and so we did the music. Actually, funny enough, the guy Chin, who sings on, uh, the only one, or one and only—I can't remember the name of that song. The one and but, only. Um, <laughs> one and only. Bless your heart. Bless yeah. your heart. Um, so Chin, who sings on that song, he produced the updated version. Started DJing like every washed-up rapper does. At some point, you just find yourself DJing. So now, through the pandemic, uh, this was a great source of escapism for me hmm. to reimburse myself into uh, a life of digging. It was something I did as a young man. And um, so, yeah, I, got, I really got into 45s. I got into collecting 12s. And, and then I was playing music. And so now I've got a couple of vinyl nights. And I have a girl who's 11 years old now. And it was great for me to be able to pivot slightly into something that w- was keeping me into Vancouver. Right. For me to be an artist, it really meant the only shot and chance I had to uh, to provide and survive was to be on the road. And that was getting more difficult, not only for me, but it was, it was a little bit more difficult as an artist as well. Uh, so it, 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 this provided me with a, with a birth, kind of to be able to stay with my hands in music and from a different side. So, um, but still writing, uh, wrote something today. There's a guy named Ivison Black in Toronto. He used to be the name Skits, and he's a friend of mine, and he reached out. Uh, d Rack has reached out. He's got a song with Prevail, formerly of Swollen members, currently of XL the band. So that that's going out. I was in a, another band with uh, two guys from Mother Mother. That's on hiatus because during the pandemic, Mother Mother went like 
extraordinarily through the stratosphere. Yeah, yeah. You know, when people are inside TikTok, uh, their song Hayloft became a TikTok sensation. They opened for Imagine Dragons across Europe and now, oh, our little band that was just kind of having some fun and just getting uh, getting its 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 a little bit of wind underneath its its sail um, obviously had to be put on pause for the for the greater good right, for right. for the big for the big dogs to go out there and eat so right. but that's it man I'm in North Vancouver so I'm kind of where where I'm where I'm from you know I moved around a little bit here and there spent some time in New York spent some time in Toronto and yeah. I am like five blocks from the hospital I was born in. <laughs> circle nothing wrong with that <laughs> north Make Vancouver. It far. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> you were a part of sweatshop union and um still am still am okay fair enough uh clearly the wikipedia needs to be updated uh <laughs> oh yeah okay <laughs> but uh, i remember when you guys came to uh, prince george you played at the generator with sweatshop union and it was an incredible sight to see and i mean you guys always like you as a performer as well as the groups that you are with like you always put out a, a polished product. You look like you're having fun. It's like putting on an old shoe. It's comfortable, but at the same time, functional. Like you are always are on your top game. And like, it, like I, I, I've, I have a feeling like, like myself, it's like we, this microphone here is our best friend. We strive in front of a microphone when we have an audience or we know we're on our game. I mean, I think like you, you take a special, um, it's like a dedication or, or a vocation almost only approach to what you do in front of the microphone. Mm. You know, how you present yourself, what you say, how you say it, and the fact that um, it's a gift to be able to have anybody listen to you. And it's, it's, uh, it's important to be able to know what you're saying, saying it in a confident way or talk about the things that you know because you can leave an impression and what kind of impression do you want to leave on the world? Yeah. So yeah, I think that it's something that anytime that, that I performed, uh, don't get me wrong. There's been a couple of nights where I'm sure, you know, the bottles yeah. you know, uh, <laughs> intervened a little bit, Fair, <laughs> um, but I've, I've, I've always put an utmost respect and, and value for what the position entails yeah. um, as an MC and as an, ent as an entertainer. Yeah. Uh, I, I just, you know, it's one of those things that I still hold uh, in such high regard. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I, I don't. I don't know if like this is a sore subject, but it was 20 years ago where you made an impression on myself. You made an impression on the world. The album "Say Something," uh, the song yeah. "This Is My Hit" uh, again, yeah. like one of my favorite jams of all time. The music video, uh, like I could I could watch that over and over again because it's just so much fun and it 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 portrays a very important message, but at the same time, it is just a wicked jam and. It. I know the story, <laughs> but I feel as though that you were cut off at the knees at, from something that was completely out of your control, and it was a, a damn, dare I say, fucking travesty. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I I appreciate that, and I appreciate that you know that's that's the hometown support there. Mm. But you know. A lot of time has passed, and just to fill people in, I essentially I got a record deal by, by basically um, getting some buzz as a spoken word poet. Yeah. Although at the time I was doing a bunch of things, I had a I had a very kind of controversial piece called Hate, which which was about race, and that led me to Sony. Sony was was pretty infatuated by the fact that that piece and me as an artist was fairly brave, mm. but. If we're being, you know, the the one thing that I wasn't at that time, I, you know, I'd only been writing songs in a studio for a couple of years. And some people get it right away, you know. You, yeah. you see, like, some people have it at 17, 18, and they are a very polished product and in their first record. But, you know, I think that I did not truly value the ability to be a songwriter or somebody who could write a chorus or the importance. I, I truly thought that even that's very indicative in that song i thought any chorus that you can put in on a song if you've got a machine behind it, it is going to take off yeah because you know you got the machine that's going to get out to millions of people well you know i did have a very fair shot and i had a machine behind me and that song as it was an indictment on the record industry 
But, you know, it, it, it hit a select few. It didn't necessarily cross over and blow up. Right. You know, that being said, at that time and even now, I've never really written the song for it to be something that would be classified as a radio song. You know, okay. even back then there was there was a very formulaic way of getting on the radio. Yeah. You know, rap radio was different then than it is today. Yeah. But it wasn't necessarily something I subscribed to. But working as a songwriter years and years now, I certainly have a lot, I lend a lot more credence to people who are songwriters, mm -hmm. you know, as for me, I would have just written poems and verses and right. never really cared. But the majority of people in the world are going to be attracted to a melody and a chorus first. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I am in the severe minority of somebody that was always really infatuated by the word and by the lyric. So, you know, halfway through the record uh, at that time, 20 years ago, I was signed to Sony. BMG and Sony had, had merged and BMG took over Sony. Right. So the hardest thing that you can do to an artist uh, is is shelf them. If you drop them, they got a shot for somebody else to sign them. Yeah. But it's kind of like if you're playing for the Vancouver Canucks, they don't have any intention of utilizing you. But they also don't want another team to pick you up and they kind of just put you down in the minors yeah. for you to toil. And they have the power to pull you up, but they just kind of, they're gonna let that contract die. You're gonna lose whatever steam and heat you had. And then four or five years later, now you're a lot older and you know, it, it's, it's tougher to make it back up there. And again, as a guy who didn't really you know, that wasn't my goal. My goal right. wasn't to be a signed uh, musician. You know, I was very much a part of Sweatshop Union when I did get signed. It just, it was happenstance. Yeah. So it was a learning lesson and it's, and don't get me wrong, it's fun to talk about. It was, it was fun. I saw a lot. I learned a lot. Yeah. And, you know, there's a couple of things I would have done differently, but in the most part, I at least can look back to what I was saying, what I was trying to say and the message that I was trying to relay and I can, you know, it's not like I'm embarrassed to show my daughter that record. No, I, I would hope not. My God, it's a masterpiece. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> you know, it's not bad. Well, I've like again, this is this is just me being like geeking out, and the fact that I'm speaking with you again. I've had to buy that specific album, say something twice uh, on CD because I burned out the first one. So. Oh man, that's amazing. <laughs> and what's your favorite joint on that on that record? Or do you uh, have one? On saying something, it, it is. This yeah. is my hit. Uh, uh, although, um, oh God, now the song is blanking me. Uh, it was it was the song that is like on that Canadian uh, movie uh, road trip that went from Victoria to Toronto. They were at Much Music. Uh, it was a love song. God was damn. that sex? Yeah, probably it. <laughs> That's yeah. probably it. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, yeah. so no, like Make again. A love song. One of my one of my favorite one of my favorite albums of all time. Uh, it's, oh, cheers, man! It's 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 kind of a shame that like none of my like none of the vehicles come with CD players anymore. They all come with no. USBs, and even still, like we have Spotify, we have streaming services. You don't own the music anymore. Like all my all my CDs, my my vinyls, my even my cassettes. Like I I go to secondhand stores just to buy them, and the rare occasion right. I can find something like that in a new record store. Like we don't, unless unless we do something about it, like we will not be able to own any of our entertainment physically anymore. No, no, we won't. Then we don't. So yeah, yeah, I uh, yeah, the music industry has been has been toppled many times over, yeah. unfortunately, um, and I just don't see any grassroots movement in that changing anytime soon unfortunately you know again being around the block in a couple of other industries you, you just see how much we'd given away and it's it's unfortunate but i get it well behind really, you behind you is an incredible collection of, of vinyls now how long is it taking you to I, to uh collect that well that's not i mean that's not all of my vinyl um it's not that long, you know. Really? That's not lot, that long. No, it's not. It's it's funny because yeah, during the pandemic is when I started. I, all I wanted to do was get the record collection back that I lost. So, oh. you know, I lost a, in a you know the early 
2000s, late 90s, I like I lost my record collection. So I was just kind of on a mission to do that. And then, you know, because of Flip Out from here and uh, Vinyl Richie, a.k.a. Scott Arkwell, those guys kind of dropped the 45 bug in my ear. So, yeah, the majority of my records here are are 45s. I've got more 45s and full lengths. And I, I, they, they hit me and I got bitten by it. So I'm on Discogs and I'm going on digs. And whenever I'm out of town, I'm making time to stop at record stores. But that's probably only five years, five years. And that's, I mean, that's not the entire collection, but, but uh, yeah, it's about, uh, only about five years. That's not a, that's not a lifetime by any stretch. Do you, do you have like a constant wish list of, of records that you oh. are searching for? Yeah, I've got, a, I've got a list on my phone of records that I want to buy. I've got Discogs where when they come up, I get I got pinged. And then, you know, sometimes I've just you, you, things hit your list or you, you don't even know that you're looking for it. And oh, man, it's it's fun. It's fun because it's such a journey. And every now and then when you do five diamond in a rough, it's 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 great. Yeah. Unfunny funny story not to name drop, but it just because it's it's a fun DJ record digging story. Yeah. There's a song by Santana called Maria, right? It was a this big, big song, this pop song. I was like, ah, oh, it'd be cool to have it when I, when you know, when I play out because it's a popular song. Mm. And I, you know, I, I like the song and I love Santana. So I find this rare 45 pressing and I buy it from um, dude Sean Lala, elsewhere Sonido, and um, I get it. And I, I was playing it, and it's and again, like sometimes in Jamaica they would do. They would just kind of rip shit and they would make 45s of songs that were hot because it was cheaper, it was better. And if they didn't, they'd have to mess around with, with, with getting, uh, you know, shit from the label flown out. Yeah. So they would create these bootlegs. So I got one and there's, there's not a ton of them around. And I was playing it out quite a bit. So like my record bag, I uh, was like, oh, I'm just going to take it out. And I was like, no, no, no. I'll, I'll. There's a girl that at this, this place that I work, one of the waitresses likes that song. I'm like, okay, I'll keep it in. Walk, I'm, I'm playing records and yeah. um, dude walks in and he's like, hey, DJ. And he gives me like the two guns. I'm like, <laughs> oh man, I know that guy. Yeah, yeah. I know that guy. He like, looked like, I don't know, like 50s or something. I was like, maybe he's in Blood In or Blood Out. or I, I just try to, like, he's got a real loud shirt on and I'm thinking, there's no chance. I thought, well, maybe I'll just look and see where Carlos Santana is. And I look and he was in Vancouver the night before and he was going to Penticton like the next day. I'm like, oh my God, that guy has been drinking one from the fountain of like fountain of youth or he's got the best surgery. It's like the best surgeon ever. I spin that Maria Maria song yeah. and he comes back over and he was like, oh, bought me a couple of houses. And he's like, Wait, I've never seen it on 45. I'm like, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> It was super cool. Unfortunately, the place that I work at is a spot called Bot Botanist at the Pacific Rim. So I play there on Saturdays. Yeah, and it's a, it's kind of like a fancy restaurant, fancy hotel. So you can't really fraternize with guests. So I couldn't, you know, mm. ask him to sign anything or get a picture with him. But it was pretty cool that you know I, I had that record. I was going to pull it out of my crate that day, and then in came the artist. And I, you know, of of all people, of all people, Carlos Santana. Oh, Santana. That's amazing. <laughs> and he was lovely. He was a lovely man. He, he came over. And, and I said, before I even he heard my music, he gave me the... So I played like some dog whistle shit because I, was like, I wasn't quite sure. So, you know, I've got like old school Latin shit that I was like, oh, maybe. And I could kind of see kind of see his head and I'm, I'm, I'm just going to spin it and turn it up and see what happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which can be an asshole thing. Probably yeah. if someone did that to me, I'd be like, why the fuck are you doing that? Like, <laughs> <laughs> I did it. Yeah, that's it, fair. That's cool. Like a soccer, but fun. Yeah, it was all right. Oh, right on. So, like, what is it that you do uh, these days? Like, because I like looking through what I have in front of me. Like, uh, there was a partnership, of course, with the Vancouver Canucks when they were on that incredible run yeah. years ago. Uh, of yeah. course, you've worked with uh, Sweatshop Union, uh, the Swollen yeah. Members, and many other different artists. You've been in. I do remember you telling me about the uh, Peak Performance Project, where you were required to freestyle for like an insane period of time without stopping. A hundred minutes. Jesus. <laughs> that was stupid. I mean, <laughs> like I, I came up with it, but it was stupid. I, you know, looking yeah. back, like it's not even that interesting. And, you know, I'm a. I was a decent freestyler. I'm not like junk or, 
some of these people that are incredible. Yeah. So, you know, it's like, if you can kind of freestyle, if you're decent, you can probably freestyle for a long time. But, you know, if you, maybe that video's got like 15 people who've like been able to watch the entire thing. Like yeah. I wouldn't be able to sit through the entire thing. So it was more of a gimmick than anything, but yeah, I freestyled for a hundred, like 105 minutes. Yeah, yeah. But like, what, what are, what is it that Kiprios is doing on a day to day now? Day to day. So I have been really fortunate in, uh, in doing a bunch of voiceover work. Oh, shit. so yeah. So, and that was super by fluke as well. So there was a, a spell of time where I was the voice for jumpman 23.com, which is Michael Jordan, Michael Jordan's brand. Right. I did everything for Jordan. And then I was doing everything for the Jordan athletes. That was for the online, uh, website. So that was Carmelo Anthony, Derek Jeter, Michael Jordan, Chris Paul, yada, yada, yada. And that was great. That was like the first gig I ever had. And I get this incredible gig I've done, you know, stuff with a bunch of other uh, brands. I've done I've done work with the Canucks. I've done work with the Columbus Blue Jackets. I've done work with the Jackson Jag uh, Jacksonville Jaguars. I'm the U.S. national voice for Tempur-Pedic in the States. And um, and then I DJ three, four times a week um, and I still write music. I license music. Uh, I'm just kind of jack of trades, master of none. I got sticky fingers, and I just basically stir the pot. What's bubbling? So my every day can can change up, mm -hmm. but generally, if I'm in the city, I'm working three or four nights a week DJing, and then um, my days are are writing or recording. Yeah, yeah, that's about that's about it. But it's been I got to tell you, it's been a pretty charmed life to be able to. In the same city as as my wife and my daughter because it it didn't happen for a long time yeah no no and like uh, first of all man after my own heart jack of all trades present uh right. <laughs> and, right. and, and secondly like i i am i'm a big big fan and a big pusher of the idea of like you you create your own situation and you create your own luck like it, it i i understand that it took a lot of grinding and sacrifice and uh, you know, failure and success and whatnot to get to a point where you can be comfortable and be like, you know what, I'm doing all right now. I'm happy where I am. Like things could be better, but like things could also be a lot worse because I've already been oh, there. Geez. Yeah. You know, yeah. so that is yeah. so cool. No, I'm, yeah. I mean, things could be a ton worse. Um, and, you know, things could have turned out a lot worse as well. Yeah. I, I, uh, no, I'm very content. I have to shake myself sometimes and, 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 and break away from some mundane thoughts because, you know, I'm very lucky to to be able to have made such a, a an irrational decision at a young age and still be on that path. Yeah. You now, whether or not it's, it's diverged a little bit, uh, at the beginning of my career, I was a guy who was infatuated with with words and lyrics and writing and music and theater and film and to be able to still, you know, make a living from being voice work and, you know, all of my things kind of uh, patched together. It would help one another. You know, the fact that I was into theater and, and, and acting and film made my stage show better. Yeah. You know, the fact that I was into poetry made my writing better. The fact that I was into recording gave me some kind of jump, like jumping off basis uh, to be a voiceover uh, actor. Mm. So, you know, I was just, I'm just very lucky because, you know, there was, there was a time where I, it wasn't so hot for me. I did, um, I worked a couple of years with the good people from uh, Prince George and Caribou. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I worked as a rep in Vancouver for a couple of years, and that was a lot of humble pie, man. That was that was tough. And then I started doing some work in social media for them, and again, just built momentum back into kind of transitioning into more DJ work and, and getting some more voiceover work, and I did what I had to do, and it was great, man. I was up in Prince George a couple of times, and I love. I mean, I love PG. I always have. I've got I've got really great friends up there, and. Yeah, I think you got a great town. Well, as you know that, but um, <laughs> well, yeah, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm originally from Vancouver. I don't know if you knew that. I grew up in Wally, uh, off of 135th Street and King George. Like that was my childhood okay. right there. Uh, it was okay. only, um, 
I guess it was only in 2004, no, 2003, where myself and my uh, fia- uh, my fiance at the time moved uh, from Vancouver to Prince George because we needed a, a reset. And since gotcha. since then, like, yeah, Prince George has been like, there's no turning back. Like, we we love the big city feel in the small community, and that's essentially what this is like here. So yeah. No, it's great. I know, you know, it's funny as I've gotten older, a lot of, a lot of my friends and a lot of the, my peer group is dipped out, you yeah. know? Yeah. Um, no, I get that. I understand. And it's great. You know, it's, it's great. I, and I get it. You know, it's not like my wife and I haven't had conversations about, about other places, but yeah. you know, Vancouver for me is, it's a bit of a security blanket because I'm very insulated with friends, family and a network here. Um, that's always kind of provided one way or another. So mm-hmm. it's it's hard for me to 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 think about leaving where I have such deep roots. And you know, for me, nothing's promised. You know, there's not a paycheck every two weeks. Yeah. Uh, you know, I know people here and there that if I need work or if I need a dollar, I can I can go dig it out. Yeah. So it, that means the world to me to have that uh, that type of community here for me personally. Yeah. No, absolutely. Like you know, far far be it for me to like try to uh, poo poo Vancouver or anything like that. Like I know that. Oh no! Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that it really does come down to the community that you build, the family and the friends that you surround yeah. yourself with. That ultimately makes what you are in a home. It could be Vancouver, it could be Toronto, it could be Moose Jaw, it could be Prince George. Doesn't doesn't matter at all. It it really depends on who you are and the people who accept you and you invite into your life. Yeah. Yeah. Super facts, my friend. Well said. I, I, I know I know we're on a bit of a, a, a time limit here, so I do want to ask you a few quick questions if you don't mind. Uh, one of them is uh, with voice acting, like would you ever or have you done any sort of video game or cartoon character? I have done, I was in a UFC game for EA. Okay. I was one of the coaches. Okay. Animation. I've I audition constantly. I've got a little bit of work here and there, but nothing. It's such a tight knit community. The voiceover circle, especially the animation circle, yeah. it's very hard to break into because the people that are there are very good already. Yeah. And they, you know, and a lot of people might say, well, they've got the relationships and blah 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 blah. They've got the keys. When the truth of the matter is, the closer that you get to it, and the more that you learn about these actors and you follow what they're doing there's a reason why um it's it's very inside because a lot of people that have climbed and broken their way in there are fucking great so yeah yeah for sure uh it, it's it's something i would love to get a series one of these days so yeah. i'll keep auditioning i'll let you know no, no absolutely <laughs> yeah. i'll be yeah, keeping yeah. an eye out for it uh, yeah. The second question is, is uh, if you had to pull immediately like the rip cord on a uh, DJ session, what what album are you pulling for for an automatic positive response? An album? Like a whole album? Oh, just a song, album, whatever. Like you're pulling for a vinyl. It's this one. This one's going to work. Which one is it? I mean, that's a great question. It's a loaded question. Mm-hmm. So I am not like a trick technical DJ, okay. right? As a rapper, I can do things that are, are maybe show offy or you know like I, as a DJ I'm very ma- meat and potatoes. But one of the good things that I feel that I've started to be able to do in the last couple of years is be able to read a crowd, and I think that's a lot in in the world of like in a DJ world. Yeah. So you know if, if if I walk in and and it's a younger crowd, you know I uh, it kind of d- depending on what the look or the feel is. I'll size it up. If it's an older crowd, then it's just like, okay, and it look, they look like they want to dance. It's pretty hard to go wrong with like off the wall Michael Jackson to get people to move. Yeah. You know, and then if they're older and it's like white people in there, you're like, okay, well, maybe some Fleetwood Mac. Yeah. If it's younger, then you kind of have to think about, well, again, is it is it a more alternative crowd? Is it more of a hip hop crowd? Um, yeah, it's tricky, but it's it's fun because when you have 45s, you're just packing around the singles. And yeah. and so you kind of have to do some reading in advance. And look, when you're vinyl, it's like, shit, I made a bad read. It's a <laughs> yeah. way younger crowd and I fucked it up. But then you're just you can just try to hit to them, hit them to some game. 
yeah. you know, to, to some shit where it's like, oh, okay, that sample is, you know, is something that Kendrick sampled or it's something that, you know, like Wolfpack fucking used or sounds like, you know, d- depending on a room. So I'd have to see the room to be able to make like a better call. No, that's a good answer. That's a solid answer. I mean, that's pretty much the, the type of men- mentality that I would have if I was in this situation again. Yeah, absolutely. Right. You got to read it. Exactly. Question I've been asking all my guests through uh, the beginning of this year. What was your first paying job? Oh, shit. Uh, first paying job? Yeah. I was a really, like, it was a slimy telemarketing job. Um. And I didn't know it was slimy. I kind of thought it was slimy, but literally one week would be the Cana- like the Canadian National Institute for the Blind. And then the next week would be like wildlife. The next week after that, it would be PETA. It was always changing. And the guy would kind of come in with a script. We were, four- I mean, I was 14 years old. My friend, Willem Bajo, this really sharp Ugandan dude that I grew up with, mm. he, uh, he had this... Well, this is William. I'm calling on behalf of the Canadian National Institute for the Blind. And he would just, at 14, know to lower his voice, change his tone completely, and his sales were through the roof. Oh. And again, like, it was weird that you get commissions on, you know, the Donations. Canadian National Institute for the Blind, on, on donations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that was my first job at 14. I was I was telemarketing. Oh. You know, yeah, you know what? Was, yeah. Young, got to start somewhere and, uh, you know, full of promises and hope. You know, I can't I can't necessarily blame you. I, I will not necessarily slimy, but uh, definitely overpriced. I was a door-to-door vacuum salesman for one summer. <laughs> I knew a guy who was doing that recently. You can go door-to-door and sell anything. You can sell everything. Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. Like, yeah. And, and I didn't know that because, you know, I had a little I had a little bid in sales. I had to learn it. There's a, there's a fucking swag yeah. with sales. And I remember the guy that was, was mentoring me, you know, being like, Hey, you can sell this, you can sell yourself and you could sell, you could sell beer. Yeah. And then if you could sell beer, you could sell like radioactive, like, you know, nuclear reactors and shit. Like yeah. it's all about again, fostering relationships. People buy more into the people that they know and trust. Yeah. And if you develop relationships with people, you develop trust. It's like, cool, they'll give your product a shot. No. You get it through the door and then it sells. Like That's on the product. Yeah. So, you know, so if you were doing vacuum sales, like, that's a fucking grind. <laughs> it was a grind. Yeah. Like, you know, this shit's like some of the, and it's great. Like, telemarketing wasn't even close to like one of the worst jobs I've had. Yeah. But, you know, I, I've learned so much and I've had so much, I've got so much more gratitude for the more challenging employment I've had over the years. Well, good. Final thing before we go is just like, where can people find you? Are you on social media? Where is your next performance? And where can it, people enjoy the likes of Kiprios? Yeah, I mean, best places are Twitter at Kiprios12, Instagram at Kiprios12. Those are the ones that I'm kind of frequenting more. Not as huge a social media person, but you can catch, you know, if you're in Vancouver and you're looking for something to do, Check me out. Uh, usually Thursdays, I'm at a spot close to home called the Black Kettle. Fridays, I'm at the Brew Hall. Saturday, Botanist. Saturday nights, sometimes the Queen's Cross, the North Van, or I'm playing out. Yeah, I just hit me up with a follow or or just check in on me, and, and you'll you'll find you'll find something to do. But cheers, man. Honestly, I truly appreciate you taking taking the time out of your day to talk to me. It was awesome. No, pleasure's all mine. Like I appreciate the fact that you're willing to touch base with me again and sit down and have this conversation. It's been too long, and that's on me. I apologize. I literally am a massive fan of you still to this day, and it's intimidating. It's but you are the oh, man. man. Well, that's that man. That's from my heart. That, that means the world. And look at us still doing what we love. So <laughs> this is congratulations true. to you, and thank you for letting me be a part of your journey. Because, uh, yeah. Yeah, and I hope it's not ten years before we talk again, or something. <laughs> I will make sure it's a lot less. I promise. Next time I come down to Vancouver, I'll hit you up. Hit me up. Absolutely. Hit me up. Thanks for making it to the end of this episode. Big thank you to you for watching, or for listening, or for checking out my website, themediajack.ca. There is where you can find other episodes, other content that I create, as well a link to the Patreon where you can support my show, all my work 
directly. Also, where you could submit ideas, suggestions, or maybe you want to ask a future guest a question. Patreon is where you can go for all of that and so much more. And also get a shout out just like Red Wolf Dawn, our executive producer for this month. Big thank you to you once again. And check out themediajack.ca. The merch is there. You can get a really comfortable shirt like this supporting the Media Jack or my partner, the Iron Bikini. Or maybe you just want to get yourself a good mug or a gym shirt or something else that tickles your fancy. Themediajack.ca. Take care.